Thank you, everyone, for coming here tonight. My name is Ken McKim, and I'm here to talk to you about a subject that's very important to me personally, but I believe has a national importance as well, and it has to do with chronic illness in our nation. And uh, if this were my TED Talk, uh, I would have named it the slow death of compassion for the chronically ill. And admittedly, that is a very long title, but it accurately reflects, I feel, what I've seen over these last few years. Now to clarify, I don't have a chronic illness. My wife does, she has Crohn's disease. And for those of you who might not know, Crohn's is an autoimmune disorder that creates inflammation and ulcerations throughout the GI tract. So normally it's confined to the bowels. Sometimes in extreme cases, it can migrate up into the esophagus. It's very painful. And I have seen just about everything you can think of over the last few years helping her manage her illness. My big wake up moment though, my big aha moment was when she came home from work one day, and this is back when she still could work. And she was devastated because she had been pulled into a, a small room by her bosses and told that she needed to look less sick while she was at work because she was making other people uncomfortable. Let me say that one more time for emphasis. The corporation she worked at that had 300 plus employees and offices not only in North America but all over the world felt completely comfortable having her come into a room and being told, a woman with an incurable chronic illness, that she needed to look less sick because her being visibly in pain for eight hours a day was upsetting to other people. And that's when I realized that things had changed somewhere along the line. I was no longer living in the society I, I had thought I was. And that there was some serious work to be done because this is not a good trend. This happened because our society has evolved to a point that it allows that kind of behavior to happen. And I feel that's, that's wrong, and we need to take a serious look at that. And I've also been witness to all kinds of well-intentioned advice over the years that carries with it an undercurrent of judgment that most people aren't even aware of in themselves as they're saying these words. Uh, and again, it just all kind of flows into a, a societal shift, if you will. Too many inspiring stories. Now, I can hear in your heads you're all thinking, what? No, there's no, no such thing. You can't be too inspired. You can't have too many inspiring stories. And I admit on the surface, it, it might seem silly, but, but stay with me here. We all know the type of stories I'm talking about. They clog up your Facebook newsfeed almost as much as the political advertisements do. And I'm not trying to take anything away from the people that are featured in these stories. They bring hope, and I don't want to take hope away from anyone. They're important for a reason. Like, for example, this gentleman. Most of you might not recognize, well, you might recognize him and not know his name. He's Arthur Borman, and he was heavily featured in a video that went viral a few months back. He's a disabled veteran who was told he would never walk unassisted again. And yet, through a strict regimen of yoga and other forms of exercise, he was able to, by the end of his YouTube video, sprint towards the camera. And again, good for him. He found something that worked for him, and he ran with it, quite literally. Uh, or Valerie Harper, who went on Dancing with the Stars with advanced brain cancer. Again, that's an accomplishment worth noting, worth celebrating. I get that. I read a story about a, a girl in college who developed a cancerous tumor behind her left eye. And it didn't slow her down at all. She's not only studying for her master's degree in biomedicine, but she's working on the second of two novels. So these stories are important, but they have had a rather unforeseen consequence. And it has to do with how our brains can be very easily programmed. For example, if you go to work tomorrow and you see someone there that has pink hair, out of the blue, they have pink hair. Your first thought might be, I bet they're gonna get fired. And then their second thought might be that that's different, that's not normal at all. But if that person manages to keep their job for another six months or so, eventually your brain will rewrite its definition of what normal is to include that person having pink hair. The same thing has happened 
with all these positive stories that are shared millions of times throughout social media, Facebook, G+, Tumblr, Twitter, MySpace, well, not MySpace, no one uses MySpace anymore, but all the others. And it's led to something that I have dubbed the Rocky Balboa problem, unrealistic expectations. Because now society's collective mind has been reprogrammed to think that people that suffer from chronic illness or disability, their narrative story should follow that of a 1980s sports movie montage, wherein you receive your diagnosis, you go through a brief period of depression, you have some inspiring conversations with friends and family, and then you cowboy up. You write that novel. You go to college and get your advanced degree. You run a marathon. Whatever it is, there is a definite thread that you are expected to follow because we see so many of these inspiring, overcoming at all odds stories. When in fact, they are extraordinary achievements. They are not the normal and should not be used as a baseline to judge all chronically ill people against. That's completely unfair and unrealistic. For so many people that suffer from things like fibromyalgia and Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, their Rocky Balboa moment for the day might be finding the strength to just take a shower, to stand in their own kitchen and fix themselves something to eat before they have to crawl back to bed because just that much effort is too painful or too exhausting for them. And yet our society looks down on those people now. We judge them as somehow lacking because they're not rising up to achieve all these great things. We have completely unrealistic expectations of them thanks to too many inspiring stories. So now we look at them and, and judge them as somehow inferior, somehow weaker. They don't want it enough. They're not trying hard enough to just be better. Now, of course, that's not the only thing that has affected society's attitudes towards the chronically ill. There's more than one culprit here. And the next part of my talk has to deal with the mainstream media. I feel that there is a very obvious mainstream media bias against pharmaceuticals, especially against pain medication. The media love to print and publish all sorts of stories about the evils of pain meds and the way they phrase it, you would think that we must have millions of people overdosing on these medications every year. It just seems like it's all out of control. And they love that. And these stories, the bad news stories, travel even faster than the inspiring ones because bad news travels fast, obviously. So uh, it's really telling what's been happening it's a subtle manipulation. It's funny, it's very subtle. Most people don't even realize that when they're reading these stories, when they're seeing the reports on the news or watching these videos on YouTube, that they are being coerced into a very specific emotional reaction. And I'll talk about that next. Basically, change one thing, change everything. And it really is that simple. And I'm using a picture that some of you might recognize. This is Mr. Spock from Star Trek, the original series. And I'm using this particular image because it refers back to an episode called Mirror Mirror, where the crew of the Enterprise ends up in a parallel universe and everyone there is evil. And they chose to represent that change in this well-known character's behavior by giving him facial hair, which I guess means facial hair makes you evil. And what else do you need to know? Thank you, good night. No, uh, but it's a very simple change that communicated to the people watching it how they should feel when viewing that particular incarnation of something that they had previously come to know as being different. And of course, we can do this with words. It's very simple, and the mainstream media are marvelous wordsmiths. And so I have for you tonight two sentences for your consideration. Not at all alike in dignity. The first one is this. Johnny takes medications. Immediately, we feel some sympathy for Johnny. We don't know anything about him, but we now know that he is sick enough that he has to take medications to manage whatever is wrong with him. 
We're not making any judgments about Johnny as a person or anything he's done or might do later. He is a sympathetic figure. But, again, we're going to change one thing and change the entire thing. Johnny takes drugs. Johnny is now no longer a sympathetic figure. We envision, what do we envision? Cocaine, PCP, methamphetamine, crystal meth, all sorts of illegal substances. And by extension, we are now judging Johnny as a person because he does drugs. Drugs are bad, and by extension, so are the people who take them. We have now made a moral judgment without knowing any more than we previously did about Johnny because of switching out this one word. Medications have now become drugs. And through the master message craft of a mainstream media with a very tangible bias against pharmaceuticals, you see this over and over again. People are not overdosing on prescription medications. They're overdosing on prescription drugs. Again and again, over and over. So now we have already established that the people who aren't living up to the new social narrative of overcoming their illness, despite all odds, they're not trying hard enough, they don't want to be well enough, now we're making judgments on their very character because they're taking drugs to feel better. So, we've all been fairly skillfully manipulated into having a very certain feeling about pain medication in this country. How do I know that this has actually happened, that there's been a real effect? Well, because the government has decided to step in. Last year, in 2013, an FDA advisory panel formally recommended to the DEA that they should reschedule any and all medications containing hydrocodone to be Schedule II medications rather than Schedule III. What does that mean? Well, it's fairly complex, but to boil it down to its simplest terms, these are going to be harder to prescribe and harder to get for the people that need them. Schedule II medications, you can't do refills. You have to have a separate written prescription for each 30-day supply, not to exceed 90 days. Now, maybe if you have a chronic illness, and maybe if you're working with a pain management clinic, that might not be so bad, because some of them are a little more sympathetic, because pain is their job. And they can write you three 30-day prescriptions, give them to the pharmacist, and say, just fill each one of these concurrently, as, you know, consecutively, as they expire. But for many people, they don't get to go to these pain management clinics. They're not always covered by insurance. So they have to go to a GP to get these prescriptions. And let me tell you, GPs in this country, general practitioners, are terrified to prescribe pain pills. They don't want to do it. That's why they generally try to refer you out of their office, because they don't want the liability, and they don't want the government coming in and combing through all their records. So they're scared to do it. They certainly aren't going to write you three consecutive 30-day prescriptions. And if they are going to write you a 30-day prescription, you can bet you're going to be in their office. They do not want to write you a prescription for anything without seeing your face. And that means more money. And you say, but Ken, what money? Everyone has health insurance now, and all these visits are free or next to free because of Obamacare. And then I say, please wake up, have some coffee, it's right over there, because that has not happened. We still have millions of people in this country that do not have health insurance. And I don't know if any of you have priced out what an office visit goes for. Well, I know one of the local offices here in town charges $96 every time you have to come in and see them in person. And for someone paying out of pocket, that's a lot of money. So we have now added another financial burden, financial pain, to people whose lives are already plenty full of enough pain. Thank you very much. And how do I know that this isn't going to work? How do I know that making all these medications into Schedule II isn't going to magically fix all these overdoses that we're seeing? I know it's not going to work because of OxyContin. OxyContin has always been a Schedule II medication. It has always been 
it's always been dependent on those more stringent prescribing regulations, and yet there is not one other drug that is given more credit with kicking off the era of opioid abuse in this country than OxyContin. Going back to the media message again, they have crafted it so skillfully that now when we think of illegal drugs, we are just as likely to lump in things like methadone and morphine and hydrocodone and codeine and OxyContin into the same space in our brains that we reserve for things like cocaine. It's not going to work. It's going to add another layer of pain to people who don't need any other layers of pain. Now, I would like to believe that people allow this to happen, that our society has gotten to the point where it's comfortable with our government stepping in and making life harder for all these people because they just don't know any better. And the FDA themselves would try to back all of this up by numbers. They'll point to the amount of deaths. They'll say, all these people that have died. Well, let's actually take a look at some of these numbers. The CDC estimates that opioid overdoses in this country have claimed 125,000 lives in a 10-year period. Sounds like a lot. Statistically, it's not a very high number. And although there's a lot of outrage and, and these kinds of numbers have led to our government trying to step in and, and legislate this problem away, there's something that killed more people than opioid overdoses from 2000 to 2010. Alcohol. Alcohol killed more people in that 10-year period than opioid overdoses. 139,093 deaths. And yet, where's the national call to raise the drinking age across the board to 25, to take all of the alcohol out of the grocery stores and the mini markets and confine the sale of that substance to just liquor stores that, by the way, you won't be able to purchase anything from after 3 p.m. on a Friday. And for those of you who have ever had to fill prescription pain medications, you know why that's funny and sad all at the same time. So alcohol is worse. But again, no national outcry. And I think these two statistics, 125,000 deaths to opioid overdose versus these significantly higher deaths by alcohol, nothing else betrays our hypocrisy as a society better as to how we react to those numbers. Now I get it. Everyone's concerned with numbers. So let's, let's look at some more numbers here. The CDC also estimates that in this country right now, there are anywhere between 3 million and 6 million people who suffer from fibromyalgia. So for the naysayers out there, let's go ahead and take the low end of that spectrum. Let's say it's just 3 million, just 3 million. They also estimate that there are 700,000 people in this country that currently suffer from some sort, some form of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's ulcerative colitis, 700,000. So let's combine those two for a total of 3,700,000 people. Now, of those, let's say that only a quarter of them take pain medication. And I know that number's too low, but for simple math, let's say just a quarter of those people take pain medication. So that leaves us with 925,000. Now, if we take the CDC's numbers for the year 2010, that year it was 17,500 people that had died of an opioid overdose. So we'll take that number. That's still less than 2% of that 925,000 people taking pain medication, which means that 98% of these people are taking these medications without ill effect, without dying. Yet our instinct as a society is to punish the 98% who aren't doing anything wrong. They are trying to live the best lives they can, having been dealt a very lousy hand, given diseases they didn't ask for and certainly don't want. It's, it's crazy. It makes no sense to me how we can do this to the sickest of our society. 
it just it makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. And you know, if you want to see this number, the 17,500, you want to see that number go down, I'll tell you what's going to help. It's not legislation. It's education. We need doctors to spend more than 90 seconds per patient. We need them to take the time to explain to people who take multiple medications how those medications can interact with one another. They need to make sure that everybody gets that before they leave that consult room. They need to know that if you're on a fentanyl patch, you can not eat or drink anything with grapefruit in it. And if you're currently on a fentanyl patch and watching this video, and your doctor didn't tell you this, you need to fire your doctor and your pharmacist because it will kill you. It will kill you dead, as they like to say. And this is the kind of thing that's going to bring those numbers down, not legislating and making it harder for the people who need these medications to get them. Now, again, I think a lot of this happens. I think the, the judgment that's passed on the chronically ill as being somehow shiftless or lazy or drug-seeking, I think that a lot of this happens because of ignorance. I truly believe that most people do not fully comprehend the amount of pain we're talking about when we're talking about people that suffer from these diseases. So I want to attempt tonight to kind of end that mystery of pain. Fibromyalgia is a little bit harder to do that with because it's a nerve disorder. So I've had it described to me from people who suffer from fibromyalgia that it's kind of like your nerve endings are on fire. So if you want to approximate that, go home, light a candle, stick your finger in the flame until it really hurts, and then imagine that coursing throughout your body at varying intervals, pretty much nonstop, all the time, and there's no cure. Crohn's is a little bit easier to demonstrate because we can stick cameras in places that normally cameras should never go and get pictures of what's going on inside the body of a Crohn sufferer. So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures that I hope will communicate to you on some level exactly the kind of pain that these people are dealing with and why they need these painkillers. They're not pretty. You don't look sick. That's the worst thing you can say to anyone who has any of these so-called invisible illnesses, just so you know. So, on the left, we have a picture of a healthy bowel. It's pinkish, yellowish, looks nice. On the right, you might think you were looking at a really nice piece of steak with a lot of white marbling through it, but we're not. This is ulcerations. This is the inside of the bowel ulcerating. It's extremely painful, and it can happen throughout all parts of the bowel. This is what these people, some of them, are going through on a daily basis. But again, this is something that's going on in the, on the inside of the body. So most people will never, of course, see this. So they say, well, you don't look sick. So I'm going to show you what can happen when this ulceration continues, when you don't find the right mix of therapies and medications to put you hopefully into remission. And I do this because when people see wounds on the outside of the body, they're a little bit better able to grasp just how painful it might be. This is called a Crohn's fistula. This is what happens when what you were looking at a moment ago on the inside of the body works its way to the outside. And there's pretty much not a person alive that can't look at that and start to really finally get a handle on the kind of pain we're talking about. This is why they take narcotic painkillers. This is why they can't just take an aspirin or an Advil. This kind of pain does not go away because you have a more positive mental attitude. This kind of pain is not managed by deeper breathing or yoga positions or running around the block. This kind of pain is managed by one thing, 
and that is prescription narcotic painkillers. And for our government and our society to be okay with restricting access to those painkillers is something that I consider borderline abuse of the sickest of our citizens. And it's It just breaks my heart. So there is work to be done. And you might say, well, what can I do about this? Well, there's a couple of things. <clears throat> One, there's a petition that I have created, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've created, um, that the link to it at petitions.whitehouse.gov will be given to everyone here in person tonight if they wish it. And it'll be on the uh, description part of my YouTube page where this video will go up later. And basically the petition asks the Obama administration to please direct the DEA to not reclassify these painkillers. Leave them as Schedule 3. We're not going to help anybody by reclassifying them. The second part is a little harder because it confronts all of this reprogramming that we talked about earlier that society has gone through, <clears throat> excuse me, gone through with all these inspiring stories and, and, and the media articles. So the next time you hear someone start to talk about the evils of painkillers, don't let their rant go unchallenged. Correct them. Let them know that they serve a real purpose for millions of people in this country. And the next time someone goes on a rant about, you know, those people, those chronically ill people with their invisible illnesses, how they can't really be that sick. Correct them. Educate them. Let them know that they are that sick, and they are just people who, at the... They are people, at the end of the day, that need our help. They need our compassion. And they need that compassion to be without conditions. We can do this, but it's going to take work. And it starts with everyone here and with everyone watching at home. That's it. Thank you.